want to speak to you tonight. I'll start in Matthew 16. How many's got enough time for me to deliver a message to you? We, we spend a lot of time doing a lot of different things. A lot of different things. Tony, go click that her up. She's cold. Click it up a notch. Yeah. He's cold. Click it up. If you're warm, if you're cold, move over on this side. We'll click this one up. And uh, y'all want this other one up too? If you get cold, just Smash that button up. Don't mash it down. It'll get cold. But I have I have something I want to deliver to you tonight, and uh, I believe it will help us. I was on the porch today talking to my friend Henry Ford, Brother Henry Ford. And we were sharing the scripture. He brought something up. I want to probably preach on it on Sunday. But he brought up something that was, it was uh, quite like nothing I ever thought of before. The power to have someone in your life to discuss the scriptures with. So if you come back Sunday, you're going to get to maybe I'll be able to form around our conversation. And he touched me in that. And I recognized, Brother Marvin, that all of my life, I have had somebody like that in my life. Now, I don't know if you recognize that like I'm going to probably make a point of it Sunday but one reason the church is so important is so that you can come and we can have this time of hearing the word but it's critically important for us to have those people in our lives that we can call and say hey he did it before church. He said, hey, I was reading something. He started sharing that with me, and it touched me. Yeah. So if you come back Sunday, maybe I'll, I may go that direction. <laughs> Matthew chapter 16 is tonight, verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples. He asked who? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? The Son of Man am. He asked them. They said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Let me ask you tonight. Everybody look up. Who is Jesus to you? Peter answered, you're the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Jesus, verse 13, he said, Who do men say I, the Son of Man, am? When he asked his disciples, Peter, he said, You're the Christ, you're the Son of the living God, not the Son of Man. He said, the son of the living God. Look at your neighbor and say, there's revelation in this. <laughs> Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I will give you what? I will give you the keys. I will 
grant you access to the kingdom, the king's domain. That's what kingdom means. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, be killed and raised the third day. There's a lot in that verse right there. Peter took him aside. Began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. If we could tonight, let's put ourselves in Peter's place. Could you imagine what might be running through his mind after he has taken the Lord aside, trying to get Jesus to see things from his point of view? He doesn't, Peter doesn't want this to happen, what Jesus has said in verse 21. And he says, Jesus, as long as I'm around, this will never happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You're not mindful of the things of God but of the things of men. Peter has to be stunned. That's why he's taking the Lord aside. And now, did he just call me Satan? Why? Would you, can you just imagine what's running through his mind? Why did you call me Satan? called you Satan because you are not for the reason that I am here. You and I aren't on the same page, Peter. You don't get it, Peter. Well, I've watched a lot of people that didn't get it. You're not mindful of the things of God. But rather, you're more mindful of what you want than what God wants. Peter, you must think you're, I'm just that living here, you must think you know more than God, son. Uh, let's get to that. When we think we know more than God, when we think we know more than God, the danger of our own ideas. Amen. The danger of our own thinking, our own reasoning. See, pride comes in a lot of different shapes and forms. Pride even comes in the realm of good intentions. There's a saying that says, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Man's philosophies, man's theory, man's religion. Paul said this in 1 Timothy 16, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they erred from the faith, they what? Erred from the pace, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So we, I, I just wanted to, to mention this at least, to know that the love of money is the root. 
You know what root is? A root. I've been digging up some stumps, roots. You can't see it on the roots of most plants. You can't see on the surface. Some are shallow, run across the top of the ground. But the root, Brother Taylor was talking to me about a tap root. The root is under the ground. You can't see the root of what's going on. Paul says the, the root of all evil, the root of all evil is a love for money. What, what I want. That's what money does. Money gets me what I want. And he says, be careful of that because many have erred from the faith over this root. Proverbs says this, 616. There are six things the Lord hates. Okay, seven are an abomination to him. First thing he mentions is a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed in some blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. Seven things listed by the wisest man that ever lived outside of Jesus. And the first thing he mentions is pride. Because we know Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a holy spirit before a fall. Destruction of what? Relationship. Relationship. Destruction. The thief comes not. John 10, the thief could not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. Pride comes before destruction. What's going on in the setting when Jesus hears what he hears from Peter? He hates it. Uh, this he hates it so much he calls Peter Satan it was the reason one reason he did this was because of Peter's pride you gotta think a whole lot of yourself to, to rebuke Jesus Come on. Come on, man. Peter doesn't know it, but he's in a test. When the test came, the test came, they come to the garden to get Jesus. That night, he denies he even knew the Lord. Three times he denies he even knows the Lord. Yeah. Why? Because he thinks he, he was struggling with something. He thought he knew more than the Lord. Why does he deny the Lord three times? Because he thinks more of what man's thinking so he denies he even knows the Lord. Because he, he, he's so scared of what man's thinking. He's denying he's even known the Lord. See, Peter, we have to be careful because Peter is the picture of humanity. We, we don't want to get down on Peter, but Peter's there for example. He, he's helping us with our human condition. Mm -hmm. See, things aren't working out. Why does he doubt, deny the Lord? Because things are things are not working out like I thought they were. They were. I mean, Jesus has told me that they're going to come get him, and I've taken him aside, rebuked him, and got he called me Satan. Yeah. Now he's denied the Lord three times. That he even knew him. 
when the pressure came, Peter, because of what he wanted, what he thought the way it should be, Peter loses his holiness quickly. Pride took him into that. He's operating according to his own reasoning. I got to looking from uh, Peter comes on in Matthew at least. Matt, uh, Peter came on the scene to Matthew the third chapter, and then I, what I just read, I went to Matthew sixteen. So Peter's been with the Lord for a series of time here. This thing didn't just jump up and bite him. He's been through the teaching. He's watched the miracles. He, he, he's gone through all manner of things with Jesus. See, we say things like this. I would never get caught in what Peter got caught in because, you know, I, I know more. I know more as much as he, I know, you know. I, I hear people say things like, you know, if I knew a prophet, if I knew a real prophet, if I received that word from the Lord, then I would know better how to prepare myself. Peter is with the prophet. Peter is, he is hearing the word of God. And he still is struggling with his own reasoning. The chances are, if you knew the de details of the next six months, it wouldn't matter. You most likely would still be doing the same things you're doing today. If you can believe it, the word of God is talking to you tonight. If you can believe that. You ever know the person when the pressure comes? You don't get the answer you want. Doesn't go the way you think it should. And you lose your holiness quickly. Remember when Jesus, he's on the way to Jerusalem. He rides a colt, a colt, yeah. into Jerusalem. They've lined the entrance, the roadway into Jerusalem. What are they doing? They're throwing palm branches in the road. Yeah. And, they're, and they're crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But things don't go the way they thought they would. And a few late days later, the same people are crying, crucify him. Because when things, because of our pride, because of those underlying root issues, we find ourselves in the same position as Peter. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. Do not you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. If you stand for God, you are going to lose relationships. If you're standing for God and you're not losing relationships, something's wrong some, somewhere. I'm talking about relationship with the world. What caused Jesus to say, get behind me, Satan? Well, Jesus knew the will of God. Peter doesn't know the will of God. Satan. I did a little study on Satan.
Satan is not a name, it's a title. You might want to write that down. We do start seeing Satan used as a proper name. But throughout the Hebrew Bible, we have a few places where we see this figure, Satan. It's more of a job title. It refers to the accuser. The one who accuses. The one who, this title, in fact, is the revelation of who he is. He's the opposition of God. He's the adversary. The enemy. The fact is, he's called the devil, the serpent, the dragon, the tempter. But these are all descriptive titles of who this opposition to God is. Someone says, well, Lucifer was Satan's name. Lucifer is found in Isaiah 14 and 12 and simply means this morning star. As I, and I'm reading this. Where did you get this, brother? Well, I'm, I'm reading about this. Why didn't God reveal Satan's name? You know, Satan was an angel. He was one of the... And he fell. Jesus calls Peter Satan not because he is Satan. It's because Peter has now taken the role of opposition to the will of God. Well, I started, so I've never heard this before. But it started to make good sense to me. What's Peter missing? He's heard the Sermon on the Mount. He's seen all matter of sickness and disease. Healed. He believes in the Lord. But he's struggling to take him at his word. Or, yeah. Oh my goodness. What? He believes in the Lord. But he's struggling to take the Lord at his word. How many Christians do you know believe the Lord? They believe in the Lord, but they're struggling to take the Lord at his word. Well, we don't just, we don't believe that. We're Baptist. We don't believe that. We're Methodist. We're Pentecost. Well, I've known the Lord since I was a child. But do you take him at his word? All right. What is Peter? Look at Peter. What is Peter missing? Peter, he, he believes, but some of the things that are going on, he's struggling with. You ever had a struggle like that? You have, whether you can sit in and think about it right this moment, you, you've had some struggles. Yeah. I've got proof that I make people mad. <laughs> I can prove that people struggle with me. I can call names. I shouldn't do that, but I could. So we got struggle at time. We got to be careful because if we're not, we don't watch it. We'd be a whole lot like Peter. What is it Peter is missing? His faith is developing. He's denied the Lord. Now he's ostracized from all the other disciples. 
He's off by himself now. But after the resurrection, Jesus said, you go tell my disciples and Peter. Oh, come on back, come on back, Peter. That's, it's a picture of our humanity. It's a picture of the man who thought he knew, but he didn't. But I want to read something to you tonight, Cody. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. I'll read it where you just sit there and listen. Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this, this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days. God says, I will pour out of my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision. Your old men will dream dreams. Oh, my servants and both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. They will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above, signs of the earth below, blood, fire, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great glorious day of the Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man handed, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. Oh, oh, what he got into. He got into the will of God. Help the wicked man put him to death by nailing him to a cross. God raised him up from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you did not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died, was buried. His tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. That he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised up this Jesus, and we are all witnesses of it, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord sit, said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to the people, What, brothers, what shall we do? Tell us what to do to be saved, Peter. Peter said, Repent. Be baptized. Every one of you in the name of of the man who died for you. That's right. All right. The name of the man you killed. That's right. Jesus Christ. For because your sins are to be forgiven. There is no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved but at the name of Jesus. That's why the world has a problem with Jesus. Come on. They don't even want you to say Merry Christmas. Repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. This is the birth of the church. And you will receive. Say it's a promise. It's a promise. The gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you. It's for your children. For all who are far off. For all whom the Lord. As many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other war words. He warned them. He pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. 
Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Something happened to Peter. Peter is no longer missing the point. He finally gets it. He's no longer worried about what anybody else is thinking. Because he's been filled with the Holy Ghost. His pride is not running him. Yeah. <clears throat> I was standing there tonight and there Tom's praying so that all of you will understand he's about to baptize this man and woman. And he's speaking words that you can all hear and you can say amen at the end of his prayer when it's finalized. But as he prayed, I wasn't praying with him. I was praying with the Holy Ghost. I was praying in the Spirit. Because there is a place and it's called the baptism where you're not praying out of your own intellect and your own reasoning. You're praying out of your spirit. How many in here have got a spirit? Raise your hand if you got a spirit. Most of the time when we pray, we pray from our soul, the seat of our emotions, the personality of who we are, and how we feel about whatever's going on in our flesh. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, yes. He has the, act, the ability to access our spirit. Amen. And our spirit in Him, that's why tongues were given, Tongues were given. When a man speaks in tongues, the Bible says he's not praying to man. He's praying to God. A lot of times we're praying prayers so that man can hear and agree in it. Nothing wrong with that. But there's also a prayer in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, through your Spirit. And what he does, he prays for things that you don't even know how to pray for. You ever been in a place you said, I don't know what I'm going to do? Raise your hand if you've ever been in a place. That's when you need the Holy Spirit to pray. Peter. Thank God for Peter. Jesus used Peter to help us see our humanity of who we are. Are we more mindful of the things of men than we are mindful of the things of God. Stand with me, please. Wow. Did he just call me Satan? Can you imagine that? I don't want to be in opposition to the Lord. How many? 
I mean, with me tonight. I don't want to be alone. Pray with me. Father, we come to you tonight. Come on, pray with me. God, we need you desperately. God, thank you for allowing us to see what Peter was struggling with. Thank you for enlightening us to the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. For in these things, they are working for us. God, I pray for everyone who is standing here with me. I pray for the power of the Holy, the gifting and the power of the Holy Spirit to be filled in every life. For your word says that it is for those who obey him. And as many as the Lord our God shall call. And I believe you've called us. In Jesus' name we pray. And the whole church said.